today's lesson, we're going to kind of pick up with something called hydrates. And this is going to be a variation on the empirical formula problems. So a hydrate is an ionic compound that has a fixed ratio of water molecules bonded to it. For example, copper two chloride can be a dihydrate where it's got two water molecules bonded to it. It's called copper two chloride dihydrate. You can have sodium carbonate with one water bonded to it, sodium carbonate monohydrate. Or cobalt two chloride with six waters bonded to it is called cobalt two chloride hexahydrate. Now these water molecules are chemically bonded to the hydrate, but they can be driven off with the application of a substantial amount of heat. So if you heat it up, you'll drive off the water and just leave behind the ionic compound itself. So these hydrates have a lot of uses. For instance, uh, cement is a hydrate where the water chemically bonds in with the silica. And um, you can actually reuse cement by crushing it up and heating it back up and driving the water back off. It, it can be recycled. Uh, drywall or plaster um the gypsum that's used to make for instance the walls of my house uh that is a hydrate of calcium sulfate and if it were heated up in a fire for instance some of that water would be driven off so now we're going to focus on the calculations they're performed similar to empirical formula problems where you convert grams of your anhydride in other words after the water has been driven off into moles and you convert your grams of water into moles and then you divide both things by how many moles of your anhydride you had to figure out your water of hydration. So I'll walk you through a sample problem here. So in this example, we have 3.97 grams of hydrated copper two sulfate and it's heated up strongly. And after all the water is driven off, the anhydride, in other words, the copper two sulfate without the water weighs 2.54 grams. So what this tells us is we had 3.97 grams of copper two sulfate with some amount of water added to it. And after we drove off all the water by heating it strongly, we have 2.54 grams of copper to sulfate without water. And if we do a little bit of subtraction, if we subtract the copper sulfate from the copper sulfate and the water, that tells us that we had 1.43 grams of water. So now we need to take these grams and convert them into moles and copper two sulfate has a molar mass of 159.62 and water has a mass of 18.02 so if we take 2.54 and we divide it by 159.62 we get 0 0.0159 moles and if we take the 1.43 over 18.02 we get 0 0.0794 moles. So now we divide everything by the smallest number of moles, which is 0 0.0159. So that comes out to be one. And this comes out to be 4.99, or we'll call that five. So this is CUSO4 with five waters added or we would call that copper two sulfate pentahydrate so now that you've seen how to work that problem the next thing i'm gonna do is i videoed myself doing an experiment with a hydrate of magnesium sulfate mgso4 and so in a minute i'm going to show you the video lab you're going to want to write down the data that i collect and then you're going to want to see if you can actually calculate 
the name and formula of the hydrate. And then in Google Classroom, I have posed a question where you need to post your answer to what you think the mass, the name and or the formula is. I'll take either or or both. I just won't either the formula or the name. The name's probably easier to type in if you don't know how to do a little dot on your computer, uh, like the, the little dot that goes in between them. So either way. So I'm going to show you that lab now. All right, for today's experiment, I'm going to take a crucible and I'm going to weigh it. And you can see how much the crucible weighs. And now I'm going to take some magnesium sulfate. I'm going to add it to the crucible. You can see how much the crucible weighs now. Then I'm going to take the magnesium sulfate and I'm going to heat it up over this Bunsen burner. So I'm going to light the Bunsen burner real quick. And you can See what the magnesium sulfate looks like right now. Looks like some little white crystals. Something's definitely happening in there. Looks like we're starting to drive off the water. Adjust this to get this a little bit hotter. All right, and we will check back in on this in just a minute and see what happens. It's been several minutes and if we check in on everything it looks like we've driven off pretty much all the water and the bottom of the crucible is glowing 
red hot. So I would say we have heated this up about as much as we're gonna get it. So now we're going to turn off the Bunsen burner. We're gonna let this cool down for a few minutes. All right, it appears that the magnesium sulfate that we have dehydrated has cooled down sufficiently. You can take a good look at it. And so now we're gonna come over to the digital scale. And we will see exactly how much this weighs. So now you can see how much it weighs. So, based off of that information, uh, figure out how much water was driven off, and then see if you can figure out the formula for this hydrate. Good luck. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that lab. Don't forget to go post your answer into Google Classroom where I asked that question. So now we're gonna continue with the second part of our lesson, where we're gonna talk about mass spectroscopy. So a mass spectrometer is a device that measures the relative masses of atoms. So this can be used to with atoms. You could also use it with uh, compounds if you wanted to, for instance, find the molar mass of a compound. But the key thing about mass spectrometers is all it tells you is mass. So if you're ever asked a multiple choice question, for instance, in the AP classroom assignment I'm going to ask you to do today, then you need to keep in mind that the only thing you can actually determine is things that have to do with mass. You can't figure out charge. You can't figure out uh, chemical reactivity. You can figure out mass. Uh, mass spectrometers provide evidence for the existence of isotopes, and it's used to determine average atomic masses. So if you want to figure out what the average atomic mass of a substance is, you can take a sample of, for instance, carbon or any other element and inject it into a mass spectrometer, and it will tell you the different isotopes that you have and their relative frequencies or their relative abundances. And so you can estimate the um, average atomic mass from looking at these weighted averages. And I'll show you how to do that. But first, let me show you this image of how a mass spectrometer actually works. So you take a sample and you, let's see, you inject it into this section right here where it says sample, and it passes through this beam of electrons, which will actually strip the electrons off of your atom or off of your sample. And then there are these two positively charged disks right here, which it will attract those um, atoms through it and accelerate them. And then it'll pass this magnetic field. And magnetic fields will deflect things that have electrical charges. And then the tube curves and the least massive out, the least massive particles will deflect the most and the heaviest particles will deflect the least. Uh, that has to do with the concept of momentum for those of you who are physics minded. So the lightest particles go this, bend the furthest, the heaviest particles bend the least, and this little detector plate determines where they hit, and so it can tell, relatively speaking, what the different masses are. So that's how this works. So the data that you would get would be something that looks like this. So it would show you mass. So there's a huge peak at 20, and then some very small peaks at 21 and 22. So for instance, this sample right here of whatever this is would have an average atomic mass. If this was just one element in the sample, it would have a mass that's pretty close to 20. But since you have some peaks that are a little bit higher at 21 and 22, its average atomic mass is probably a little bit higher than 20. And if you search on your periodic table, well, we've got fluorine is 19. That's no good. That's too low. 
Neon is 20.18. That looks like a good candidate. Let's check the next element. Sodium's 22.99. That's almost 23. That's way too high. You couldn't get an average of 20, 21, and 22 and equal 23. So this is likely a sample of neon. And this is it in a bar graph form as well. Shows relative number of atoms. You could actually perform a detailed calculation with this, where um, if this relative number is a percent, you could say, well, uh, we have masses of 20, 21, and 22, and it's 91% that, so times 0.91 and times 0 0.003 and times 0.09 or 9%. So if you do this, and this comes out to be 18.2.063 and 1.98. So you add these together, And that comes out to be 20.243, which is pretty close to what's on the periodic table for neon. So here's another sample. This shows the mass spectrum of copper. 69% of it has a mass of 63 and 30% of it has a mass of 65. So you would expect the average atomic mass to be between 63 and 65, but closer to 63. So it's probably going to be like 63 point something. When you check the periodic table, it's 63.55. So that's how you read a mass spec.